If you enjoy our videos and podcasts and would like us to continue putting out regular quality content, head over to patreon.com forward slash aircrewinterview where you can donate monthly and in return you will get rewards ranging from early interview viewings, bonus clips, credited as a producer and much more. Thank you and enjoy. And then you had uh, a chance to fly the F-18A+. Uh, tell us about yep. this. How, how did that transfer onto the reserves with the Navy? Tell us about this mover. Yeah, so I actually got hired to go fly A-10s at Barksdale in Louisiana. I was trying to get closer to home to where my family is. It's where I grew up. Mm-hmm. And they closed, too. So I was 0 for 2 with A-10 units. I, everywhere that hires me apparently gets closed. So... I don't know if that's me or, or them, but lucky, man. <laughs> yeah, I guess. So I had a friend, uh, funny story. I was cross country in the F-16 and a guy I knew from the first A-10 squadron when it closed, he had gone to the Navy Reserve and we were, we almost had to divert because uh, another Hornet guy had shut down the runway and we're like, ah, what an idiot. And so we landed, they, they're towing the airplane in on two flat tires. And I'm like, huh, oh, it says VFA 204 River Rattlers. I know a guy there. So I took a picture. I texted it to my buddy. And then I hear from behind me, so what if it is me? And I'm like, oh, hey, dude. And he basically, you know, told me land of milk and honey. Hey, we, we you know, we're red air. We do dog fighting. It's a really great squadron. You know, you should come out. And I was like, I don't know. But then. The A-10s closed, and I really wanted to get to Louisiana, and it sounded like a cool, hey, let's go, you know, I mean, Navy Reserve, that'll be awesome. So yeah. I did a full-up uh, inter-service transfer, took about six months to get all the paperwork and stuff done, and I uh, just laterally transferred uh, to be a reservist in the Navy uh, and flew there from 2012 until 2016. And is that like a normal thing from like a U.S. Air Force blokes and girls and stuff like to transfer to the U.S. Navy? No, that it is very common to go the other way. Uh, I was like right. a fish swimming upstream. I mean, there was it was I was like, you know, there there's probably maybe a handful of people that have done that. It is mostly the other way around. It's usually Hornet guys that go fly the F-16, not right. F-16 guys that go fly the Hornet. So there was a lot of we don't know really what to do with you. Uh, you're the first one we've tried, um, you know, so it was kind of a lot of thrash with that. Although the guy that convinced me, he had done it, you know, a couple of years or five or six years prior, right. but it's still, it, uh, there wasn't enough corporate knowledge that, you know, it was all like the first time anybody had ever seen it. Yeah. So tell us about like, what was the training like going through the U S Navy and how did it differ to the U S air force? <laughs> yeah, well, there's a bit of a laugh in there. So <laughs> it's, it's oh boy, it, it's I, I tell you, um, the Air Force is very structured. The Air yeah. Force is very, you know, uh, this is what you can do. And here's your day. You know, we're gonna we're gonna you know regiment it out very well. The Navy is not. And when they sent me to training, they sent me to what's called a cat cat other category other course. So basically, they said, go to Oceana, uh, Virginia Beach, and y- you'll get a- 10 hours in a check ride, and that's it. And I got a, a basic Form 8, uh, which is my instrument qual, NATOPS qual, and then they said, I didn't even know how to work the radar when I left that place. I was like, wow. well, I know how to turn it on, but I don't know any of the switches and stuff. So the very <laughs> first, yeah, so you know, I was like, hey, I'm going to go try to get some air-to-air sims and stuff. And we had a hurricane roll in New Orleans. They're like, no, we need you back. We need you to go hurrah a an airplane. So the ink wasn't even dry on my NATOPS thing. I had 10 hours in the airplane. We, we launched out, did this hurricane evac. We go to Fort Worth, and I'm like, in the Air Force, we're done. We're just going to sit here and wait it out. And they're like, no, we're going to start flying. You're flying with CAG and DCAG tomorrow. And I go, well, first of all, who are they? And second – what what are we doing? They're like, you're going to do intercepts. I'm like, OK, well, now that I know who they are, they're the bosses. You know, they're the, the TSW guys. I said, I don't even know how to turn this radar on. And you want me to go out there and do intercepts? And they're like, yeah, you'll figure it out. And so I was like, no, I'm not. That's no, I'm not doing that. So I, one of the guys is like, OK, look, we'll take you out and we'll just do some basic Navy formation just to get you used to it and stuff, because it was my first two ship sortie. Mm-hmm. And I, I'll never forget the first time he starts pumping the nose, right? 
And I'm, I'm like, okay, sweet. I know what that means. I go out to a mile line of breast. And he comes on the radio and goes, dude, where are you going? And I said, I'm out of tactical. Just pop me out to tactical, right? That's where I'm supposed to be. He's like, dude, that's the signal for a rejoin. <laughs> I'm like, oh, my God. Yeah. All right. Well, this is going to be. And, and so that kind of set the tone for how it was because everything was – the, it was like the first time, right? They, I show up to the squadron and they're like, okay, we've got this adversary tactical syllabus. We want you to be a, a, an instructor. I'm like, okay, well, can somebody teach me first before you ask me to instruct? And they're like, go watch the DVD. I'm like, what the is the DVD? <laughs> and they're like, and, and they're like in the vault, you go in and then watch DVD. So I go put the DVD in and it's no kidding, a Top Gun guy with the sticks teaching bfm and i said well why don't you just sit there with me and you do it so i don't have to yeah, like yeah, we can make this live action i don't have yeah. to watch the dvds like no i don't have time for that you go watch the dvd so there was a lot of back and forth on that whereas if you go to the air force it is here's your syllabus if you do well you proficiency advance if you don't do well you do the full syllabus and we will you have to hit each square mm -hmm. you know so it in some ways, the Navy's a little bit better because it's more, hey, big boy, you know, we, we expect you to be really good. But on the same token, there's a lot of opportunity for, well, how come you don't know this? You know, we give you enough rope to hang yourself because mm. we didn't really give you the tools to succeed. So that was a little bit of a culture shock that took me a while to, to, to get on board with. Yeah, I can imagine. And so what was the role of a pilot on a Hornet Reserve Squadron? Adversary air. So we would adversary, uh, yeah. provide fleet adversary air for um, mostly we would go out to Fallon or uh, Key West and provide red air for, you know, whoever the, the rag or fleet squadrons or whatever. Uh, sometimes we would teach like I had to get uh, checked out in the uh, adversary tactical program. And that was teaching dogfighting to growlers and prowlers i mean that was essentially we could teach it to the frs to the, the the rag itself but primarily the growlers would come down and we would teach um you know the basic concepts and definitions and setups and stuff to those guys to give them their dissimilar training uh which was required as part of their syllabus so uh that we did have because we were vfa so vfc 12 in uh oceana they're a composite squadron all they do is red air they have no blue mission because we were VFA. Theoretically, we could be called up to go do blue air missions and go to war. But the jets I was flying, pretty much the aliens had to be attacking, and Will Smith uh, needed to be, you know, being chased in a canyon before we were ever <laughs> going to be used because yeah, some we were right not <laughs> we were not in any kind of position to do any kind of. I mean. We, we put the strategic and strategic reserve. I mean, those jets just weren't able to be integrated at all. Yeah, because I, I, I think I saw in your bio, you said um, F-18A+. plus. So what was the plus mm -hmm. for? It's an avionics upgrade. So we had the center display. We had data transfer cartridges. I think it had a little bit of an upgraded radar, but not, not to the level of the plus plus. So the plus plus is what the Marines had, and those had right. the upgraded radar. We didn't have that, but you know we were getting um, we were getting Jehemics as as I was leaving and mids and all that stuff. It was a lot of the C avionics in an A, so we had the lighter nose. Um, yeah. You know, it was really it was, uh, for BFM was an amazing machine because it was kind of like the Block Thirty where it didn't have a lot of stuff in it. So performance wise, it it was just a a, a, a tough aircraft to to fight against especially with heavier super hornets and you know stuff like that and we're going to talk about the hornet heater mover but so how did it handle and what were its strengths and weaknesses that's it i mean the hornet is an amazing handling aircraft you know it is slow speed maneuvering high aoa it's kind of a good mix of what the Air F-16 is capable of doing, you know, except it'll give you, you know, as much Norse authority as you ask for, and then some. The the strengths are, you know, obviously that, you know, nose authority and being able to fly, fight slow and, and, and just being a very capable aircraft. It's got a little bit of a better radar than the F-16. Um, the weakness is it doesn't have the power. Mm. So... Whereas, you know, the F-16, because you're only 25 alpha uh, or 25 units, 
you could let out and get back. If you did some kind of energy excursion in the A+, plus, it's very hard to ever get your energy back. I mean, if you traded everything in to get that shot, you better not miss because odds are that's the end of it. You know, you're out of, out of energy, airspeed and ideas at that point. Mm -hmm. So, um, and I personally didn't, didn't care for (laughs) the life support. I, this is more of a gripe against the Navy, but we had to wear this big harness that didn't have the clips, uh, on the, the straps and like, just was and like, I'm just sitting there going, well, the air force has it. How come you guys couldn't get this, this thing? We just had to wear so much crap and it wasn't in the seat, you know? I was watching your video earlier about yeah. uh, your finny flight, and you were just like, "Bloody hell, this is like annoying." Like, uh, yeah, <laughs> yeah. It just—it was so much stuff. You had to step into the harness and then fish your way in. You know, in the Air Force, it was like you put your harness on, you clip it, and then Off once you, go. you got to the jet, you'd put the leg straps on. You know, so you wouldn't waddle out to the jet. You just put the leg straps on once you got there. Hop up in the jet, crew chief hooks you in. <laughs> Let's go fly. Go. <laughs> versus versus the Navy. You know, where it's like you got to step in, you waddle, you got all your gears on this, so you're kind of top heavy. You get in and, you know, the crew chief's like, see ya, you know, the plane captain, you know, you don't you're doing everything on your own. And it's like we're a lot more coddled in the Air Force. I mean, it's I'll admit that that's a it's a little bit different mindset. But, you know, I mean, it's what you get used to. It was I mean, it's it's um, you know, I, I did not fight as many dissimilar aircraft in that. In that jet, I was mostly against other Super Hornets or Hornets. Um, I did fight F-15s, which is ironic because the Viper, it gave. So when I flew the F-16, I never had a problem against the Hornet. When I flew the Hornet, I never fought an F-16, but the aircraft that gave me problems, the F-15, was completely easy to fight in the Hornet, which I'm like, well, this makes no sense, but okay. You know, (laughs) I mean, okay. Maybe because I'm just getting better, you know, I, I was used to it, older, wiser, more experienced, whatever. But, um, you know, it's it, it, the, the thing about, you know, which is better, which is good, you know, all that stuff. It's an any given Sunday argument, right? It's it's who's who's the stick actuator and can they properly max perform their aircraft cool. and know what they're doing? You know what I mean? If, if it's if it's not you could take a really good jet against uh, with a really bad pilot against a mediocre jet with a really good pilot and the good pilot's going to win, you know, nine out of 10 times. It, it, you know, it's, you, you just can't underestimate the person that's actually sitting behind the jet. But as far as, you know, if you're just comparing like to like, I would say they're almost, I, I would not, you know, somebody asked me this the other day, they go mover versus mover Viper versus Hornet. I'm like, it's going to be a draw. I mean, it really is because they're so similar and they just you, it just depends on how you fight and whether one guy lets the other guy go into their game plan. Because okay. if you let them do fight to their strengths, it's over for you. But if you keep the fight in your strength, well, then you're, you're probably going to win. So that's why the Air Force answer for everything is it depends because not just because it's fun to say, but because it really does. I mean, it, it, it just depends. Of course. Yeah. And being with the Navy, did you ever get any uh, carry landings? No, um, I was supposed to go to 106 because they that was part of the, you know, we really don't have a training plan for you and we're just making it up as we go. Uh, at one point they were like, OK, we're going to send you to 106 with the other former Air Force guy, the one that blew both tires. And uh, I came back from a dead at Key West and I was out with my dogs one day and I blew out my MCL. Oh, so I tore I tore my MCL and ended up it was like three weeks prior to the class start. And I missed that. And then when the squadron actually went, because we weren't a we were a shore based adversary squadron. So we had no reason to really get carry called. And we were going to do it just just to prove that the squadron could do it. And they went to the TR on a deck cert. So it was just coming out of uh, maintenance and stuff. And uh, I did some FCLPs with them. So fear carrier landing practice with them. But by the time we got to it's time to go, they're like, look, we we need to start getting rid of people because we've got too many guys that we need to get called. We don't have enough deck time to actually do it. So they're like, you really we would rather you go with um, the schoolhouse. So right. I didn't get to I didn't get to go. Uh, I went with them, but I didn't actually get to land on the boat, which sucked because, you know, it would have been cool to be able to do, especially since the alternative was I spent a week on a carrier and. The only trap I got was on the, the cod. 
uh, oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know, yeah, landing, landing, and and then the waiting too, on the yeah. boat. And I'll tell you what, I'll take you know months in Iraq over a week on the carrier. That was <laughs> I don't know how those guys do it, man. It's like prison on water. <laughs> Sorry, I I shouldn't say that because there's probably some kids that are like, oh, I want to go to the Navy. I'm like, fine, do that. Yeah, yeah fine, do that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Just uh, it's going to be miserable, but uh, yeah. yeah. Um, yeah, so let's talk about the the Hornet cockpit. How did it differ, like, compared to the F-16? Did you find it more comfortable, or, or did you find there's, it an easy there, Well, there's, there's more room. Um, you know, so you, if you talk ergonomics and stuff, um, you know, there's more room in the cockpit. However, it's less comfortable because, again, the F-16 feels like it fits you like a glove. Like, it's like, like wearing, you know, tight-fitting clothes, you know, that just – they're they're measured and tailored to you versus the F F-18, which is kind of a more of a one size fits all. Yeah. And, you know, just strapping into the aircraft for the F-16, it was, you know, you got your seat kit, you got your, your lap belt, you got your shoulder harnesses. That's it. The F-18, you've got, you know, leg garters, you, you know, you got to get all the leg garters and stuff. Uh, there's one on your ankle. There's one on your thigh. You got to get strapped in. It takes longer to get strapped in yeah. from that that perspective, and the seat is vertical, so you know it's you feel like you're kind of leaning forward after you know being in a reclined F-16 seat for your entire career. It just feels like, you know, it's it's um, it feels less comfortable in that respect. But the as far as the interface goes, you know, that, like I talked about, the F-16 is better as far as all the menus and buttons and stuff. It's all hands-on versus the F-18. You might have some stuff that's HOTAS, but then you're reaching up, mashing menu buttons yeah. and changing stuff. Um, I will say that going between the two, in some cases, they were just close enough that they were confusing. So, like, you know, your display management switch on your F-16, you may be like, oh, it does this. And on the F-18, I was like, no, that does something totally different, you know, and you're like, yeah. ah, muscle memory. You know, I'm yeah, trying yeah, to do yeah. something. It just doesn't carry over. And the weirdest thing to me was – that the trigger shoots missiles in the F-18. Right. So for the longest time, you know, Top Gun, where they, they pull the trigger to shoot the missile, I'm like, yeah. ah, that's BS. There's no <laughs> way. That's that's, that's unrealistic. That's yeah, stupid. Yeah. That's and then, stupid, yeah. you know, you go, and they're, I'm like, Fox 3. Nothing's happening. Fox 3. Nothing's happening. I come back. I'm like, dude, I tried to take that shot, but what happened? Like, I oh, got to pull the trigger. Yeah. <laughs> You're like, why? Why would you pull that? That's the gun, you know. And there's just there's just some little nuanced stuff like that, and yeah, it, yeah. it's all in, in what you what you get used to. Um, you know, the Navy had slightly different rules for when you go master arm on. You know, they would do it every roll in. You master arm on, come off, master arm off. Versus the Air Force, where it's like no switch changes on final. You know, you you fence in on the range, go master arm on, do your attacks, and then go master arm off. So little stuff like that, you know. But that's that's less about the jet and more just how the yeah. how the Navy operates. But you know, it's also a little hard to compare because even though the the so the A pluses I flew were probably around eighty six to eighty eight models. That's the same year models as the F sixteens I flew, mm -hmm. but the Navy wasn't upgrading them like the Air Force was. So the Navy was like, We're using them as strategic reserve adversary missions. So you get the avionics you got. I mean, it's really, we're not spending a whole lot of money on it versus the F 16s I flew, even though they were older airplanes, we had data link. We had all the new toys and stuff, targeting pod, the, the newest targeting pod. We had the AT Flare on the Hornet, but you know, we had all the, they were continuously upgrading and adding software and stuff like that. So we were more tip of the spear, you know, yeah, able to go fight and, and do current tactics than you were in the Hornet where it's like, well, you're, I'm looking at a green screen, you know, from the, it's the same Atari green screen as it was when it came off the line. So Mover, how many hours did you get on the Hornet? Uh, that one was a lot less. That was 400 hours. And that was, uh, you know, our, our requirement was a hundred hours a year. Um, and you know, I, I had some, you know, I had some time off from, you know, the, the God, I would, I tore my MCL. My dad died. That sucked. Um, I was out for a while for that. And then um, towards the end of my career in the Navy, uh, I was diagnosed with uh, polycystic kidney disease. And oh, I was out for uh, six months thinking I was never going to fly anything ever again. Oh. So uh, that took a whole lot of time 
you know, away from that. And that's ended up being why I, I had to leave because the Navy said, NAMI gave me a waiver, which is the, the aviation medical side. They gave me a waiver for, hey, you can go fly as long as you're asymptomatic, which I am. Uh, but personnel had their own doctors and they said, well, you can stay in the Navy, but you're non-deployable. So while NAMI said I could go fly, PER said I was non-deployable, but I was in a squadron that, again, the only way to really deploy was if the things were going really bad, we weren't going to deploy, but they're like, well, the book says it could deploy. So that's when I was like, okay, well, I started looking at other jobs and I transferred back to the Air Force Reserve because the Air Force basically said, if we give you a waiver for your condition, it's blanket. Like we don't have different personnel divisions and different sides of things. We just go, if you can fly, you're full up, you can deploy because yeah. the, 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 the way the condition is, I mean, it's a slow progression. So, cause their, their argument was what happens if you deploy and your condition worsens? And it's like, well, what happens if somebody's leg gets blown off in Afghanistan? I mean, it's yeah. like, we, we don't go where we don't have medical, but also how long was I going to deploy? Because in order for it to have gotten worse, it would have, I'd had to have been there out there for like 10 years with no medical yeah, you know, yeah. conditions or anything. I mean, it's just, so, um, that ended up, you know, 2016, I tried, you know, I tried, uh, tried fighting it and stuff and I just ran out of time. So they, they punted me over to a non-flying billet for two years while I tried to get, uh, get all my medical stuff in it in order. And I ended up transferring to the air force reserve in, uh, 2018 while, I was looking at the, you know, the light at the end of the tunnel, hoping it wasn't a train uh, at, at 2016. So I got my medical back. And then uh, 2016, I was like, they, they basically said your billet will end October of 2016, new fiscal year. You got to find another place to go. So uh, back then, I had taken my airline transport pilot written test in 2014 because that was the last year you could take it. And be grandfathered in before they did the CTP, ATP, and all the new requirements and all that nonsense. So I took it. I never really wanted to be an airline guy. I was just like, well, I'll take the test, and that way I'll have it. And then 2016 just so happened as I was losing my job, the the waiver was expiring, the grandfather clause. So I had to go take the check ride. So I took the check ride. I'm like, yeah, okay, let me go throw some apps in a couple airlines. And my airline called me, and they said, hey, we got an interview. And I said, okay. And then they offered me a job. So I was like, yeah. Sweet. This is awesome. I, you know, never expected I was going to be an airline guy, but why not? You know, I didn't have anything to do. And it worked out really well because those two years while I was waiting to transfer to the Air Force Reserve, I was still flying 737s for the airline. Um, so <clears throat> when I transferred, I actually had another job. So um, and then I transferred T-38. So it's T-38As. It's adversary uh, air for the F-22. Um, showed up there, Hurricane Michael wiped out Tyndall. So we moved mm. from Tyndall to Eglin, which is where we've been for the last, you know, uh, two years, I guess. And, uh, been doing both jobs ever since. Nice. It sounds like you've had a, an amazing career, you mover. But uh, we've got some like personal questions and also some uh, questions from our patrons, if you're happy with that. Yeah, sure. Awesome. So this is from Simon. Um, how does learning to fly the helicopter uh, compare to flying your fast jet aircraft? It's, it's different. It's a different challenge because... It, you have to reprogram your mind because everything um, it while it is physically slower in the helicopter, it is a little bit faster in that you're constantly manipulating controls. So like in, a, in an aircraft, I can trim it up, hands off, you know, let go a helicopter, you know, especially in a hover or critical phase of flight and stuff. You're always making small corrections, trying to keep it in one place and stuff. So uh, it reminds me a lot of fingertip flying because you're making those small corrections and you've got to be light on the stick, gentle on the controls. Uh, you know, don't make very don't make huge movements, stuff like that. Uh, so I think flying fighters help prepare me for it. But it's just totally different. What's funny, I was flying, I was training for the helicopter stuff, and then I went back to the T-38. The first time I went to take off, I caught myself with a full boot of left rudder as I'm going <laughs> full power because it's just muscle memory, right? Yeah, Every yeah. time you pull the collective, you're going left pedal. 
Yeah. But, um, you know, it, I, I think flying fighters really, really helped me out. And what really made it easier is because it's just a private pilot level, I didn't have to. I already had the situational awareness, the air sense, the airmanship and the ability to talk on the radio. So all I could do is focus on the flying. Like yeah. it's just it, it's so much easier than if you're just starting from scratch. Mm -hmm. And this one's from Alexander. Uh, what is your favorite Dos Gringo song and why? <laughs> Oh my God. <laughs> <laughs> oh man. You know, I have to, you, you have to love, I'm a pilot just because oh, yeah, number yeah. one, it's, it's so true. And it's the first one I ever heard. Um, I think it's easier to talk about the ones I don't like because I, 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 I and I, I don't know. I mean, um, that's, that would be hard to say too. I mean, I like the one, I wish I had a gun just like the A10 cause mm. it goes through all the different, you know, fighters and stuff. Um, uh, Hounds of War is a really good song. I wish, you know, YouTube, I know you understand this, but I wish YouTube weren't so, um, you know, with the strikes and stuff and, yeah. you know, I could get a touch because I would love to do, it's just culture, man. They're just totally. such a, uh, it's so you, you can't, you know, nothing brings me back to Friday afternoons in the squadron bar than, you know, hearing Dose Green goes blaring on a radio somewhere. Yeah, absolutely. And the last one from our uh, patron is uh, from Jin Zhang. Uh, without going into specific uh, tactical details, why is it so difficult to fight the F-22 in dissimilar BFM? Uh, I mean, the F-22 is just amazing. <laughs> you know, it's, it's, <laughs> I mean, honestly, it's got a, a ton of thrust. It's got thrust factoring and, you know, it's got the ability to... It's it's like if you if you took the F-16 and everything we talked about that's amazing about the F-16 and then combined it with the Hornet and then made it better than that, you know, yeah. because it just it, it's just got the ability to do some eye watering things. And you're just like, wow, this is you could tell that when they were designing this thing, they went to some fighter pilots were like, OK, so what do you want this thing to do? And they're like, <laughs> I would like it to be able to turn around and just point at me and like done we totally. can figure yeah. that we, we, out. We've, yeah, we've got that. Just, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Got one of those. Oh, I want it to be able to super yeah, yeah. cruise. Nailed it. We got that Sorry. too. You know, it's just, it's just that they, the, the, the real travesty is that they didn't make more. You know, that they, they shut yeah. down the program and we only got 187 of them versus, you know, they were going to have like 800 of them. You know, that, but yeah, it's, it's, it's amazing. Yeah. So hopefully that answered your questions uh, for the patrons there, guys. Um, so this is on my side. It's going to be a, a few personal questions here, Mover, if you're happy with that. Uh, uh, do you have any hobbies? <laughs> I, I know you've got you know, lots. I've funny. seen your cars and everything. It, it's, <laughs> it's funny because I'm like, I, I, it's hard. To, now I don't know what to call a hobby and whatnot, you know, because I've got yeah. the YouTube channel, which started as kind of a hobby. I write books, but that's turned into more of a business than, a, you know, it, it's kind of because it's, I've been fortunate, you know, to be able to do that. Um, I think straight hobbies would be cars. I've got a, a 2019 Corvette ZR1 that I like it's to take to the track. By the way. I've seen that. Ooh. It is, it is an amazing, it melted the emblems. Like it's got its own afterburner because it just, it's, it's amazing. Um, and you know, I, my dogs, I don't know if you call that a hobby either, but you know, I'm, big into animal rescue and, and, mm -hmm. and dogs and stuff like that and and shooting shooting sports going to the range and i, I know you guys across the pond it's it's less of a <laughs> this is as american as it gets uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but you know those kind of thing so this could be a difficult one for your uh, mover here uh, favorite aircraft you've flown favorite aircraft i've flown oh god f-16 like if oh, I if Vibe. I have to pick, for the I have to pick it. Yeah, it's it's got to be the again. It goes back to first love. You know, I loved the Hornet, but you know the the Viper was my first. Like if if you offered me the opportunity, you said mover, I'm gonna put you back in whatever airplane you want. I'd go well, I'm gonna go fly the F-16. I mean that's yeah, I, I'd go fly that. You know, tomorrow just because I I just you know you you love the you always love your first. And is there an aircraft you wish you could have flown or want to fly, uh, fly in the future? Uh, y yes. Um, I mean, obviously the A-10 was one that I chased around for a while and never got the opportunity to. I, I wish I could have flown that. Um, the F-22, you know, talking about the F-22, I think it would have been cool. I think it would be cool to fly the F-22, not so much to be in the F-22 community. And by that, I mean... 
you know, communities have their own personalities and stuff like that. And I, I think the, the F-22 community at, at my age would be a little bit challenging, you know, to go right. get used to, to that level as a Lieutenant. I would, I mean, it would have been awesome, but you know, if you're saying, Hey, what are you going to go fly today? I think, you know, it might be a little bit of a challenge. Mm-hmm. Um, I, I wouldn't mind flying the F-35, you know, if, I, if that opportunity were to present itself, I might go do that because, uh, I do joke and call it fat Amy, uh, or as, as some people call it, the, uh, the sex Panther, uh, cause 60% <laughs> of the time it works every time, but, uh, yeah, it, it's friendly ribbing. I mean, it's a, that airplane has gotten a bad rap, but it, it does do some really cool things and it does have some maneuverability. I mean, you know, if you look at it, it's like they, it, it actually looks like they combined, whereas the Raptor, they combined the F-22 or the F-16 and the F-18 and Senior. took the best and made it better. Yeah. This would be if you just combined them and just left it at that. And then, you know, so you've got, plus you added all the, the geekery and the toys and stuff. So, I, I mean, everyone I've ever talked to about that airplane that's flown it, they like, dude, I love it. You know, so I, I have to respect that. And that, that would be one that would be cool to go fly. Absolutely. And let's talk about your books because you've got like a, a, a massive range of books at the moment and also <laughs> your YouTube uh, uh, Spectra. Uh, so let's talk about that and like where can we find them online? Yeah, so uh, it's two series, but it's one universe. I, I don't know if you call it like a Clancyism thing, but uh, I started with Spectre Rising back in 2013. Um, actually, it started writing it in 2009, but took a break. And then 2013, I picked it back up. Uh, it's all self-published, you know, it's just me. Um, Spectre was, the, the idea behind the character was I took stuff that while I was flying, I'm like, I wonder what happened if that would happen. I yeah, wonder what yeah. if that would happen, you know? And then you just kind of combine it into a, you know, I, I would write it as I would go, not really knowing where it was going. And it, it actually, it worked out to a, a really decent story with Spectre Rising. And then I just took it from there and... Um, that, that's where it becomes the hobby because I used it to cope with, you know, the loss of my dad and, and kind of it helped get me through some time. So I wrote that series and then there's the Alex Shepard series. I also volunteer with law enforcement here locally. So uh, while I was doing that, I got some ideas I'm like, hey, what if I wrote something about a sheriff's deputy? And so the Alex Shepard series is not flying related. It's about a sheriff's deputy uh, who loses his family in a terror attack. And I don't know if you remember back in 2015 2016 guys were going to volunteer to uh, fight yeah. isis with, yeah, with yeah. the kurdish uh so he does that and so but the worlds collide and, and so it's kind of a you read one it's kind of a first person book you read the others he appears in the other books so i've kind of made the the worlds kind of match so uh just it's it's been fun writing it and the only problem is you know you talk about the youtube channel it, it's taken so much time as you know that it's now hard to find time to go right. You know, I've been working on the the next book for the last year, and it's just wow. it used to take me six, sixty to ninety days to actually finish a book from start to finish. Wow. Now we're over a year, and it's just it just it's, it's a trudge, man. It's a slow going at best. Anywhere ebooks are sold, I use uh, Amazon primarily, but uh, Draft to Digital actually distributes everything through Kobo. Um, through um, Barnes and Noble, iTunes, all the major distributors for the ebook side, and then for paperback, uh, it's Amazon and Barnes and Noble, and then uh, there are some hardcover versions on Amazon and Barnes and Noble as well. So it just depends on which book you're talking about, but they're all in paperback and they're all in Kindle, and we're working on the audiobooks for uh, the first three have audiobooks, plus the Shepherd books have audiobooks, and we're working on audiobooks for the rest of them as well. It's just it's a slow process, and the pandemic is really um, – the guy that was doing it was actually a medical professional, so wow. he's been uh, obviously very busy in the last uh, year with all that stuff. So, Well, you're obviously a busy man, but we obviously have to talk about your amazing YouTube channel. It, it seems to be yeah. going absolutely crazy. It's, it's, it's <laughs> going up there. So tell us about that and like how it started. That would be great to hear. It's Gawky's fault. That's what I will say. Uh, uh, I, I, honestly, I had no idea that that would become anything. You know, it it started as um, a conversation with Gawky one day, and Gawky said, hey, man, you should use YouTube to help promote your books. And I'd always talked about wanting to do a channel 
for cars because obviously, you know, I like cars and stuff. And I was going to go buy a Camaro and I'm like, yeah, that's what I'll do. I'll do a I'll do a car channel. But every now and then I'll talk about fighter pilot stuff and, and like I'll talk about the books and I'll, I'll use that as a way to facilitate that. And I did. And it didn't go anywhere. I mean, it was getting, you know, maybe a couple hundred views. You know, I had a, I think I had 150 subscribers or something. And I was sitting at this very table and I the you the book fans, because I had a Facebook page, were like, hey, why don't you tell the story of how you became a fighter pilot? I'm like, yeah, OK. So I told that story and that video went. I'm not going to call it viral because it was only a couple hundred thousand views, but that put it on the, the YouTube map uh, yeah. for the algorithms and stuff. And from there, the subscriber total just shot up. And then Hurricane Michael happened. And I did a video of me getting qualified in the T-38, stuff like that, uh, right before that. And then Hurricane Michael happened, and there was a GoFundMe for hurricane relief because a bunch of bros in the squadron were yeah. devastated by the storm. They lost everything. So people in those previous videos have been bugging me. They're like, please, just – play DCS. We want you to play DCS. We want you to play DCS. I didn't know what DCS was. I didn't really want to play it, you know, but I made a deal. I'm like, look, if you can get it to this amount, uh, I think we needed to raise like a couple thousand dollars or whatever. I'll play DCS on a video. Mm -hmm. And I, they did, I mean, they did it within less than a week. And from there it just, I mean, that's, that has accelerated the channel, you know, and then it became towards helping, um, answer questions on how to become a fighter pilot. Cause that became a thing. Yeah. Uh, you know, I started doing a mover mailbag where I got emails and I would start answering these questions and, uh, it just, it, it's been one thing after another. And I was like, wow, this is amazing. And then, you know, obviously there's been some bigger videos like the top gun one, the battlefield one, you know, stuff like that. That's obviously actually gone viral, but, yeah. um, I think, I think, you know, it, on the one hand, it's like, well, you're doing a YouTube channel. I mean, you know, it's not a big deal, but I think the, the greatest source of pride has been the ability to help aspiring fighter pilots realize that there's a chance that, that they, cause the common misconception is you have to have perfect vision. Uh, you know, you have to be, you know, you have to, if you don't, if you don't get a slot by the time you're 21 done, you're over. Yeah. Yeah. And I think generally generationally too, you know, the, the kids that are coming out of high school have very, very low self-confidence and self-esteem. I agree. And, yeah, yeah. I've seen that, yeah. And they, they are very prone to disqualifying themselves prior to even trying. And yeah, so they that's where kind of, straight away, don't they? Um, that's, that's the thing. Yep. And you shouldn't. And, and that's where the make them tell you no thing has come from because – um, I wrote the article for Fighter Sweep about how I became a fighter pilot, and I, I did that on the thing. And, and the, the theme for that was I've had a lot of people in my career tell me it's not possible. You can't do it. You're never going to be a fighter pilot. You're never going to do this. You're never going to do that. And the only reason I got through it was because I kept doing it in spite of that, and I waited until the person that was actually in a position to tell me no told me no. So that's if you make them tell you no instead of telling yourself no, odds are they won't. And you'll just succeed and you'll do well and, and you'll, you'll achieve what you're trying to do. But it is very tough trying to get through and say, stop, stop self-doubting. Stop, stop with the negative thoughts and stop. Because I'll see kids in the comments like they're asking, I'm like, why are you asking on a YouTube comment section of whether you can be a fighter pilot? You know, the answer should be I'm going to be a fighter pilot. I'm and, gonna do it. you know, I'm not going to. Yeah, I'm just going to go do it. So. That's I'm proud in that I've had some success stories where kids have come back and been like, yeah, I got a pilot slot or, you know, I'm a big fan because, you know, I, it helped me get through this or whatever. And I'm like, OK, that that actually makes it worthwhile. Everyone has been asking me on our social media about Wizzles and you shouting Tomcats. What is that about? <laughs> so please tell oh. me. <laughs> ah, oh, God. So Wizzles. Um that's more of a joke than anything. Um, you know, obviously I respect anybody that serves in the military and, you know, I, that is an inner, a pilot rivalry. I'm a single seat fighter pilot. So as a single seat fighter pilot, I don't ever feel like I need somebody in the back seat because I can do the same mission by myself. Uh, we kind of consider them like your appendix. They might've been useful at some point, but we really don't know what they're there for now. And they could probably cause more harm than good. Um, but that's, that's friendly, ribbing that's i mean that's a, yeah yeah 
Yeah, that's I mean, sometimes I might take it overboard, you know, but it's it's I I do believe that, you know, anybody that serves is obviously to be respected and, and they do a good job in their respective communities where they need it. I'm just glad that my aircraft have always been single seat. So I haven't needed, you know, when. When you look at the uh, Dash 1 or the NATOPS, you know, crew positions, it just says it's blank because it's just me. You know, there's nobody else. Uh, as far as Tomcats, uh, Tomcats, um, Tomcats. <laughs> that 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 came from a guy I actually interviewed on my channel, Oral Pleasure, um, oh, yes. a couple of weeks ago. And they were yelling it at a dining out because all the Tomcat guys, there were about four guys who previously flew the Tomcat in in our squadron at uh, vfa 204 so every time at the dining out somebody would say something about tomcats they would start yelling tomcats and so when when the tomcat came out of dcs i started doing that too uh because i love the tomcat i think it's an amazing you know i mean if if i had to fly something in the navy in the 80s you know the tomcat would have been awesome but uh you know I, I do enjoy it in dcs and that's that's where it's become and it's just it's one of those things. You say it enough times, and now everybody say it, and now it's just funny. Awesome. Well, move it. What an absolute pleasure to have you on the channel. It's been it's been great to hear your story, and yeah, check out. I'll put all the uh, links in the description below, guys, uh, for the the books and his channel. But uh, thank you very much for coming on. It's been yep. a pleasure. Thank you so much, and uh, please, for everybody, please consider uh, supporting Folds of Honor. It's a great charity that I uh, greatly support. So if you guys are looking for something, uh, I appreciate it. And thanks so much for having me on your channel. It's been awesome. Great chatting with you, and I uh, look forward to seeing more. Your interviews are just amazing. Thank you very much.